Ya. Oh, oh, nama. Oke. Oke. All right. Uh, I'm unmute myself. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm. I'm. Just, we're just waiting um, for people to come in. Okay. 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 So. <clears throat> Okay, um, good evening uh, again, and welcome to uh, SOAS and to the weekly webinar series uh, as part of the, our series about intensifying inequality. Uh, we are very honored to have with us today Khaled uh, Abu Smail and Vladimir Hasli from Esqua in Beirut. And we are also joined, we are pleased to um, to connect again with Professor uh, Masoud Kashens, who was one of the pillars of our department. Uh, and the topic of today is uh, wealth inequality and the cost of uh, po poverty, the poverty gap in the MENA region. And we are, uh, they will be, um, Khalid and Vladimir will be presenting uh, very hot new products from uh, their uh, massive machine. Uh, they've been working on poverty and inequality for the last few years with very uh, important data sets and new results. And they have updated the results to reflect some of what we know about COVID and its impact. Although, of course, this is an evolving situation. So sadly, uh, things have got worse. So, uh, but we'll see how we can uh, view that uh, with our experts and with our audience. So, so the order of the day is that I'm gonna talk uh, for a few minutes about health systems in uh, MENA. Uh, and uh, then I will give the floor to our keynote speakers, to Khaled and uh, Vladimir. Then uh, the meeting, the top, the discussion will be uh, led by uh, Masoud, uh, who's joining us from Boston. And then we'll have a question and answer session towards an end. So please, if you have questions, uh, it would be nice if you can keep them towards the end. Uh, and um, I hope you enjoy um, this lecture, uh, particularly given uh, the circumstances. And I think you'll be quite surprised by some of the results uh, and some of the poignancy, which have particular poignancy because of the dramas uh, which we can feel a lot, uh, especially in Lebanon. So I wanted to share my screen um, uh, for five minutes. So um, I'm just gonna start my slides and uh, just one second. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So, hold on one second. Okay. So, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was working uh, on health systems as an out as a, one of the things I noticed about when we were, I was working under Professor uh, Masood uh, on poverty in Nina, and I took an interest in uh, health systems. And uh, at the same time, I did a paper also, and uh, a report for the ILO in the region. And um, of course, uh, one of the key things about uh, health in the region is, uh, which I found, and I was, uh, I was astounded at that time, is that there is an absence of uh, concern for equity in the literature and in the economists that are discussing development and growth. And there was some sort of divide between the, you know, 
what the literature was saying about the state of health and the reality that you observe every day. A difference between um, you know economists like Sen and Claire Bambra and even you know WHO, the local uh, the local health researchers who were talking um, you know very simple things like that health is about social uh, is determined by socioeconomic factors by political structures etc. Uh, Claire Bambra had for decades uh, worked on work and what she calls worklessness and how, for example, have differences in uh, morbidity and mortality according to where you live and according to whether your region witnessed um, fiscality or not. Uh, she also talked about the impact of unemployment on health. Um, so these are very tangible links um, that are noticeably absent in the region, and the re uh, definitely in the uh, about five or ten years ago. And uh, so, equity and uh, labor markets are, are, of course, one of the ways in which uh, health affects poverty, uh, and you know leads to poverty traps and uh, worsens growth and inclusion. So, oh, I'm getting oh, all right. So. Anyway, so one of the, I just want to one just to emphasize that um, the problem with that is that you miss the role of health as an investment, and also uh, that the, you miss the role of health as an investment. And for me now, you really what what is really happening is that it it's not really functioning. Uh, there are so many problems with the with the systems. There are good outcomes, but the systems are not functioning. And uh, the picture across the region is the following. For example, you have a very high out-of-pocket um, out of pocket levels, and this has been the case for a long time. That means that an individual, you can imagine the situation in a COVID context, um, an individual um, to get help, to get to survive or to stay healthy, they have to spend a lot of money. And this is one of the key links to poverty in the region, and it's gonna be accelerated in COVID. Of course, just, just of the testing that is required to stay alive. Uh, and in terms of financing systems, uh, of course, this is not due to those who've worked on the poverty or social protection in the region, but we have, a, in most countries, we have a lopsided structures. So, the people at the top often have a private and a public um, scheme to the, um, um, to the top hospitals. Then slowly and surely, uh, the money available for hospitals down to the poor through a number of uh, filters that leaves really peanuts for ordinary citizens and the poor. And on top of that, you have uh, more or less, you know, um, not very developed or very uh, under, um, uh, you have a lot of uh, neglect of the actual capacity of the sectors. So, you know, you can have a clinic in Tunisia that's available for the poor, but it would be not open because they're trying to save money. So a question, you know, a situation of probably a lot of deficiencies. And of course, in the GCC is a different uh, uh, situation. Uh, but what we have there uh, is in, uh, that migrants are not part of the social protection and you have all the uh, refugees uh, that are permanent and, you know, all those who are displaced by wars. And, okay, one minute. Uh, so the, one of the key messages there is that, you know, the systems are, they produce phenomenal um, progress. But when you look them, the, at them as systems and how they're working now, they're serving equity and access, uh, they are not working and they, they need revamping. And this is not just me, this is the whole, um, the whole of the, uh, the specialists and a lot of the politicians as well. But so it's a problem of politics. The problem is, as Sam, uh, Amartya Sen said, it's a problem of society and politics deciding that some people will suffer and some, some people will not, by the way, you distribute the resources. 
And then we were hit by COVID, which uh, Claire Bamber has called the pandemic, and others have called the pandemic. Pandemic, and this graph shows you the almost direct relation to the multi-dimensional indices that uh, Khalid and his team have been working on. So you can imagine what's going to happen is that all these dimensions will become accelerator of uh, of the of the pandemic, and indeed, so you know. Now we have that the fault lines of Amina, the deficient system, the vulnerability, especially, especially in terms of the labor market, um, are very significant and they will complicate any recovery or even the management of the, um, of the current situation. And what we hope for is that basically, I'm talking about health, but obviously can talk also in the same way about education, that maybe, maybe, uh, that maybe health will cross over into economics and politics and become central because of the, as Professor Masood keeps saying, you know, it's, you know, it's about human beings and human resources and human development after all. And uh, just a, one or two thoughts uh, for, um, for the discussion. One thing you notice in, in the current situation is you do have to have the international dimension in place in your mind when you're looking at solutions uh, and ways out is uh, because of the migrants, because of the vaccines, because of so many things. But essentially, if you put health as an investment, not as a cost, uh, if you think of, um, of that as, a, as your priority, then you will find solution. And also ignoring it will not work. Ignoring it will simply means that you will not recover. You will have problems, social, political, and medical problems if you continue to ignore health equity. And I think you can see it around you uh, everywhere. And um, the last quote is from the Financial Times. It's about vaccines. But you can imagine what's happening within each country across the globe about these inequalities and how it will affect Future. Um, I hope I haven't kept you too long, uh, and so I give now the floor to uh, Khaled. Thank you um, so much, Randa, um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I've, uh, I think this is my second or third time to give the talk. Um, sorry, um, can you see me? Can you hear me? I just, we just had a power cut, so um, I hope I'm yes, still there. Uh, yes, we can, we can see you and hear you. Okay, good. All right. So this is um, one of the things that you have to get used to when you live in Beirut. So <laughs> power cuts are uh, uh, a daily uh, activity, in fact, uh, happening every uh, few hours. So um, uh, let me share my screen and I think... Yeah, uh, let me go to the beginning of the presentation, take you back. Okay, so um, again, um, I, I very much appreciate your introduction, Randa, and especially the notion that uh, you highlighted that equity considerations are, are vital and not just in health systems, but really in health systems, education systems and economic systems. And, the socioeconomic outcomes um, that we see are indeed, as Professor uh, Sen notes, uh, very much political decisions and social decisions. Some societies have far higher tolerance for inequality, others don't. Um, and there's, there's really the value added of this social research that it's, it's the numbers can only tell you so much um, but you have to sometimes go beyond these numbers to, to explain the context, the historical context that leads uh, Nordic countries to have very low, um, in, in, a, in a comparative context, very low uh, appetite for extreme inequalities as opposed to many other uh, richer uh, countries. So uh, that I think was a very pertinent uh, introduction. Also pleased to um, reconnect with uh, Masoud, who's a, a friend I uh, worked with a long time and very much looking forward to it. We have a lot to cover, so I'll go straight to the uh, discussion, uh, which as you can see is really focused on poverty and inequality issues. Um, 
Vladimir, my co-author, will be speaking um, shortly, and myself have been trying to really make sense of uh, the current situation in um, and, and, and particularly issues related to uh, money metric poverty and, and wealth. But in today's presentation, I want to go um, a little bit beyond that and cover some of the um, the, these contextual uh, issues that I mentioned, and, and going back to the 2019 report that um, ESQA and ERF, uh, the Economic Research Forum, did with uh, many uh, colleagues from uh, uh, the region and, and globally. So I'll speak a little bit about that because it talks about inequalities and in human development outcomes and opportunities that really set the stage for uh, many of these long-term and short-term uh, trends. Then a little bit about the income poverty and uh, the uh, dynamics and uh, inequality in, in, in very briefly uh, uh, before we get into the more mundane uh, impact of COVID-19. Then we come to the heart of the issue, which is um, uh, the wealth inequality. And that's where my, my colleague uh, Vlad will come in um, and speak a little bit about the, uh, the, the numbers, also about our proposal, the Solidarity Wealth Tax. And, I'll close with a few concluding remarks. Hopefully all of this in a span of around 40 uh, minutes. So human development and the Arab inequality puzzle. What's the story there? Um, I mean, essentially, what one of the main messages that um, we found in our report, uh, the ERF report, and many other reports that we did in ESQA, UNDP, others, is that Arab countries are really, when it comes to uh, their human development levels, if you just take the simple HDI um, and you look at it in, in, in a cross-country setting, um, up until 2010, most Arab countries actually um, did pretty well. Uh, most of them are either high or medium level. Some are very high human development. And when you look at the trends from 1970 to 2010, the Global Human Development Report of 2010 actually had five out of the 10 best performers in terms of human development progress from the Arab region. So that's a bright story when it comes to the basic fundamental aspects of human development like income per capita, um, uh, uh, educational achievements and many years of schooling, expected years of schooling and life expectancy. And you can see that in particular in this graph where we are uh, splitting up the Arab countries according to their human development level. Um, and even if you take 1990 as a starting point, uh, it's, a, it's a nice story. It's a story of continuous progress. And from 1990, life expectancy jumping almost by seven years. Uh, mean years of schooling, phenomenal progress here, you know, from 3.2 years on average to 6.9 now. The group of LDCs and conflict affected countries, which is that line in, in blue, obviously you see a flattening of, of, of the, uh, the trend after 2010, which is, is, is of course due to the conflicts. And, uh, uh, but generally, it's, it's, as I said, it's a, it's a positive story. And, and this is perhaps the most important graph from the ERF uh, ESQA report, is that when you look at the the gaps between the rich and poor within countries in basic health and education indicators, these gaps between the richest, the wealthiest uh, quantile uh, or deciles and between the poorest, they have been closing. So on this uh, graph, you see uh, basically on the, uh, the, the horizontal axis, you have the average annual change in uh, the inequalities, uh, and, and, and basically, uh, so that's measuring the differences between the richest and the poorest in terms of these indicators, the stunting, uh, completion of primary education, skilled attendance at birth, etc. And on the vertical axis, you've got the level of achievement itself, so the change in these indicators. So uh, where you want to be, I guess, is... Uh, if you look at Mauritania and the far left yellow dot on the upper left quadrant, I don't know uh, if you can see my, uh, my mouse here, this point right here, that's showing you uh, that Mauritania has achieved uh, an average annual reduction in inequality, inequality in secondary education of around 10%. And at the same time, it's improved the achievement by almost 8% annually. 
So that's a success story. And if you look at the distribution of all these colors in the upper left quadrant, it's basically telling you that on average, Arab countries did pretty well in reducing inequalities and also making achievements on these indicators. It's a positive story. Of course, not all of the indicators and not all of the countries. So you still have you know, Libya on stunting where you've got a decline in uh, the, the, I mean, an increase in stunting and an increase in inequality at the same time. But generally, as I said, it is a positive story. Particularly when it comes to secondary education. Um, and I wanna highlight that. So if we look at the success story in reducing inequality in outcomes uh, between the rich and poor, it's basically in uh, secondary completion rates. If you are looking at the surveys, the household surveys for the uh, Arab countries, uh, in the early 2000s, you would expect to see six times difference between the, the years of schooling between the rich and poor. That gap has been almost reduced to, to half. It's also been reduced in primary completion, skilled attendance and birth infant mortality and stunting, but not uh, by the same level as youth secondary completion, which is fantastic because that's what you need in order to uh, you know, um, proceed with structured transformation, industrial policies, demand for more uh, skilled labor force, you want to reduce these inequalities and you want to increase the achievements, especially on secondary education. Gender gaps also, uh, again, this is like you can see in health and education uh, have been closing over time. So, uh, uh, and especially uh, when it comes to uh, education, especially, uh, some countries like Sudan and Yemen, you still have uh, gaps, but over time, for the countries which we had both two surveys in time, we can see that it's also been more or less a success story. Now, um, despite this progress, this is what again the report is is highlighting. When you look at the contributions of um, multi-dimensional poverty, which, uh, as many of you might know, is essentially measured uh, in aspects like health and education uh, and uh, uh, living conditions uh, rather than simply income poverty lines, you still see that education is the main driver of poverty. And this comes out of our 2017 Arab uh, poverty report. So even with all of this progress, when we looked at the multidimensional poverty index, which we did with uh, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative and UNICEF, uh, and we decomposed the uh, poverty into its dimensions, it turns out that in many countries, especially middle income countries, education was still, and deprivation in education was still the uh, largest driving force behind multidimensional poverty. And even when you go into the inequalities between rich and poor as a level, it's still very high in the Arab region when it comes to education, much higher than uh, the uh, inequalities in, in life expectancy, for example. So even still at, at, at a basic level, education uh, inequalities between rich and poor are still extremely high, much higher than the global average, much higher than most other developing regions. So. More importantly, and I think this is where uh, one of the major messages of the report, uh, the two, our 2019 report has, has shown, is that um, the, the high and increasing levels of inequality and opportunities, as we, you can see here, were a striking contradiction to the narrative on uh, declining outcome inequality. So, when you look at um, the, uh, the factors affecting the observed inequality in terms of uh, explaining them in terms of factors beyond the individual or, or household's control, like uh, family wealth, like gender, like place uh, of residence, et cetera, and you try to explain the inequalities using these factors, you'll see that they're quite low for an indicator like stunting, you know, no more explaining no more than on average, 15% uh, or, or 10 to 15% in the case of stunting and, 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 and other health indicators. But when it comes to secondary completion rates, when it comes to the one indicator where you pride yourself as a region of, of, that that's your major achievement, it not only accounts for over 60% of that inequality, but it's also increasing over time. 
And that's what we refer to in our report as the Arab inequality puzzle. The World Bank has come up, of course, with this uh, a lot of, there was a lot of debate, especially after the Arab Spring, um, and, and, and the World Bank had uh, proposed that the real uh, the, the Arab inequality uh, puzzle was the fact that, uh, you know, you had low genies, but um, people thought that uh, inequality was, was much higher and it was a problem in the perception uh, domain rather than in the, in, 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 in the realistic uh, uh, empirical uh, or evidence-based uh, uh, data-driven domain. And the report here is basically saying, no, actually you do have a, 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 another kind of inequality puzzle. It's basically that your outcomes are not matching your opportunities. So I would like to basically sum this part by suggesting the following uh, as, as, as a stylized fact to, to derive from, from this discussion. That most Arab societies, of course, have seen basic improvements in terms of the buildup of social capital. Uh, and you've got these youth, they're better educated, and they have more equal outcomes, but they face less equal opportunities, and especially in education. That basically means that, uh, and again, it explains a lot of the frustrations that were felt by the youth and leading up to the, the uprisings, that whilst uh, they're uh, putting an effort to uh, improve their capabilities, uh, a la Amartya Sen, the system is not working for them. The, the mechanisms that allowed their parents and grandparents to uh, have upward social and economic mobility are no longer there uh, uh, and no longer working for them as they would like. Now, let's turn to the income poverty story and uh, with that context, look at uh, 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 what's been going on on, on, on that uh, front. So, um, I'm just going to jump straight ahead to uh, uh, this figure, which uh, basically tells you uh, a story of societal evolution in terms of um, the poor, which I'll accept for the time being the, the dollar nine day as a, as a rough estimate of that, despite, you know, um, I've written elsewhere that I have some reservations on, on, on the uh, the the figure uh, uh, I mean it, the 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 measure itself and and its ability to capture extreme poverty but for the time being and for the sake of time and illustration let's take it as uh, as a simplistic uh, way of, uh, of measuring extreme poverty and then moving to uh, the vulnerable group which is basically measured between one nine and three point five dollars a day lower middle class uh, three point five to seven upper middle class seven to ten and an affluent above uh, $10 a day. Now, there is some backing to using these thresholds, uh, which is basically in the, uh, the work that we did on national poverty lines. But like I said, this is a subject that would require another uh, uh, lecture. The, the point to, to note here is that uh, for the period from the 80s up until, let's say, 2010, you really were witnessing a decline in uh, poverty, uh, vulnerability, and expanding middle class, and uh, to some extent, you know, uh, the rise of an affluent uh, 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 base at the top. But since 2011, 2012, with Yemen uh, uh, and, 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 and Syria especially going into conflict, Egypt with its demographic weight and facing serious economic challenges, you have beginning to witness in 2015 a reversal of that trend. In fact, the Arab region is the only region in the world that has witnessed an increase in poverty, regardless of how you measure it, uh, whether it's national poverty lines, $1 a day, $2 a day, $3, $5, it doesn't matter. And right now, according to the paper, our expected, our, our, our our projected uh, poverty headcount in 2019 was around 8%. So if we take this curve after the uh, uh, 2015 period, it will also show a diminishing of the middle class uh, and a rise in vulnerability and, and, and poverty. That's a stylized fact. So basically, even though you've built, again, it substantiates what I've said before, that even though you've built your human capabilities, um, your economic systems have not been working, and especially after 2010. Also important to consider whenever we're talking about poverty in the Arab region is that 
poverty uh, measures are really in the eye of the beholder. If you choose uh, low poverty lines, you've got very nice stories and, and the Arab region is, is, is consistently lower than the world average. But if you move above $5 a day, the Arab region crosses over the world average. So it becomes poorer than the global average. It's not the case for East Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. Both are consistently either above or below the world average. But the Arab region is the only one that intersects. And that's the case whether you're using 2010 or the latest figures. So basically, a lot of the population is clustered right above the $1.9 a day, between $1.9 and $4 a day. And that means if you, got, if you have a small shock to expenditure or income, you're going to have a, a very large uh, poverty response. And that's exactly what happened with COVID-19. And uh, this is the data that we, uh, now I'm turning into the, the economic side, this is the data that we used in order to project our poverty impact. So basically, we took the projections from DESA, and I have to say this is April 2020 data, which um, now may give you very different results if, if we were to use like the latest IMF forecasts. Uh, the situation, especially in 2021, uh, would be rather different. So on average, uh, the region uh, is projected scenario in 2020 is a decline in GDP of 5.7 uh, on a per capita basis. Now. And in 2021, it's expected to uh, have a rebound, mild rebound of 1.2, uh, as opposed to uh, a reference scenario, a no COVID scenario of around 1.5 per capita and 1.7 per capita growth in 2020 and 2021. Now, basically punch in these figures, um, and uh, using, uh, you know, basically the information that we have about the distribution of income uh, and about uh, how uh, income will respond, its elasticity to uh, uh, the, how poverty, sorry, would, response, uh, would respond to changes in income and to changes in, in, in income distribution. And you get a picture that looks like this. You get a picture that basically tells you that the region um, and in here, I have to say that this is based on national poverty lines, which is uh, different than the international PPP poverty lines, purchasing power parity poverty lines that I uh, introduced earlier. So if I was to take the measures used by the, uh, the Arab countries themselves and use them as a yardstick for poverty, and uh, apply the shocks that uh, are you know, basically coming out of that GDP growth figure, the region in 2019 had 29% poverty, um, and it was expected to go down to 27%, almost 27.7. Instead, it's now 32.1%, which basically in headcount terms means that you have an additional 16 million people in poverty as a result of COVID-19. And that was our headline caption, uh, which we uh, produced in, uh, last year in our uh, assessment. It, does this make sense? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think it's actually quite a conservative estimate, given that, for example, the other information that we've been having, uh, such as the fact that nearly one third of the employed population in the region is, is vulnerable uh, to layoffs or, or major wa wage re uh, reductions because of the fact that employment uh, in the past two uh, decades has been focused in informal and low paying uh, sectors. Uh, so uh, when you look at the loss in working hours uh, and you translate it and, and you look at the impact on uh, employment and vulnerable employment, these figures uh, make, make sense. But also very importantly, not all countries were equally affected. And this picture that I just said, once you refine it, once you update it, because it's been changing almost on a monthly basis. So when you look at what's happened in a country like Lebanon, using May data from the statistical office in Lebanon, you get a story that is dramatically different. Uh, so in Lebanon, for example, you, you, you've got a, uh, an extreme poverty uh, rate that was almost 8% and Lebanon was uh, priding in, in, in having relatively lower poverty rates than the, the rest of the region. 
that's almost uh, tripled to 23%. Uh, and an upper poverty line of around 27%, now uh, reaching around 55%, which is basically in your blue and orange uh, uh, bars here uh, put together. Uh, and that also made for our headline news caption of Lebanon uh, reaching 55% uh, poverty rate in a span of six months because of your financial crisis, because of your political instability, because of these multiple uh, 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 overlapping crises put together with the COVID recession and you get a huge uh, impact. So that's basically our income poverty story. How am I doing on time? Uh, okay, I think I've, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Vlad in a couple of minutes, but before I do so, of course, poverty is not just an income phenomena. It's not a money metric phenomena. Uh, there's also the multidimensional poverty index, which I said is, uh, I mentioned is very important. That's not easy to predict. That's not easy to simulate. Um, and when you're talking about uh, simul uh, you know, predict or projecting multidimensional poverty, which is made up of indicators like uh, stunting, like household conditions, like health, education, it becomes a completely different ballgame. We tried to do it for Syria, for example, from 2006 to 2017. Uh, and we estimated that, for example, using our Arab MPI, multidimensional poverty index, probably the rate uh, poverty headcount rate jumped from around 38% to maybe 50 or, or so percent. Uh, but it's not easy uh, to do. What we've been doing in, in ESQA is that we've been developing a, a, a multidimensional poverty assist tool with a simulation function that will maybe help us to do so in the future. But, um, but right now I have to say that, and maybe I'd like to hear Masoud's uh, reflections on this. It's, it's, a, it's, not, it's a completely different challenge when you're trying to uh, estimate multidimensional poverty. Uh, that's why we don't really, or I don't really know for sure what happened post COVID-19. The UNICEF has been suggesting that multidimensional poverty has increased over the last few years in many countries, but I'm more skeptical. I, I just don't know. I don't think we have the information, the data you know, that will allow us to substantiate this or even the tools, the analytical forecasting, now casting tools that will allow us to make that conclusion. One last thing. If you look at this figure, what is it saying? It's saying that when you apply a multidimensional poverty index uh, regionally defined, you've got almost 40% of the Arab uh, population that are classified as poor. When you look at the vulnerability to poverty, it's around 20%. And at that, you get a picture of two thirds of the population that is poor or vulnerable. Very different story than when you use the $1 uh, a day, $1.9 a day, or even when you use the global uh, MPI uh, of Oxford University or UNDP. Again, poverty, whether it's multidimensional or whether it's income, really is in the eyes of the beholder. Inequality story before I hand it over uh, to Vlad. Um, in the region, it's basically two narratives. So one, which you get here, which is based on household income expenditure surveys that tells you that the region on average is lower in terms of income inequality than the rest of the world. And it's been declining. So this is basically the, uh, that's what led uh, the World Bank to produce the Arab inequality puzzle uh, uh, paper, which is essentially saying that this is the reality of inequality in the region. And what you have in the streets, the uprisings, that's because of some uh, perception of inequality that's much higher, but it's just a perception. Actually, um, I would argue that it's a lot more going on than it being just a perception. And the evidence is when you look at the growth rates of the economies and the growth rates of the household expenditures and incomes, and you'll see that the economies have actually been growing much faster the national accounts are suggesting economies and private consumption has been growing much faster than what's being recorded in household incomes. And that leads us to suggest that, in, and especially in middle income countries, that there's a lot of growth that hasn't been captured by households, but not all households. And basically the gist of it is that many households that are at the top end that are not 
able to be captured by these household uh, surveys properly, and Vlad is uh, more of an expert on this, uh, 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 have been accruing more of the benefits of the growth process. So in reality, when you try to correct for that, as Piketty has done, and you try to look at other sources of data like the tax data, and you try to correct for the inequality story, the, in the region becomes a, a region that has the highest wealth inequality, as opposed to a region that has moderate or low inequality. And this is basically coming out of uh, the World Inequality uh, da Database and the World Inequality Report that shows the region has 64, the top decile uh, has of income has 64% of income, uh, as opposed to maybe half of that if we're relying on uh, uh, the uh, household income expenditure surveys. Now. Let me uh, stop here and hand it over to Vlad to give, um, I guess, the more important and, and uh, issue that we're here to talk about today, which is our wealth inequality and cost of uh, poverty reduction story that will lead up to our proposal. Vlad, over to you, um, and let me know when you want me to, uh, to uh, uh, shift the slide. Okay, thank you, Harlit. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so let me continue this presentation uh, with uh, with Khalid, and uh, I hope that Khalid will uh, interject anytime he um, sees anything worth mentioning. So, um, uh, so I, this second part of the presentation links very closely to to what uh, Khalid has been saying. Um, I think uh, uh, on this slide we list some uh, kind of some. Uh, uh, observations from the region that motivated uh, uh, this work, and uh, uh, so basically the the facts that we started with were that uh, uh, in this region uh, the concentration of wealth is uh, not notoriously high, and uh, um, at the same time, people's uh, uh, a lot of people. Uh, are stuck with low incomes or informal jobs, and uh, so we uh, we started this analysis by thinking, well, uh, is there a way to uh, to um, uh, uh, um, address some uh, regional problems by linking together the uh, uh, the, the top wealth, the uh, the concentration of wealth that is stuck in one small group uh, uh, of uh, population. And, and address the, the problem that a large share of the population face at the bottom, that uh, they are income poor and uh, we need to find some, some funding to alleviate, uh, to, to, uh, to raise them out of uh, poverty. Okay, so these are two facts of, uh, uh, on one hand, high concentration of wealth and on the, on the, one hand, on the other hand, the uh, low Opportunities for growth, uh, low opportunities for uh, for upward mobility in you know in a substantial uh, uh, part of populations' uh, uh, lives uh, motivated uh, this work. Okay, um, and so so a thesis that we were exploring here is. Uh, uh, who should be responsible for raising the uh, uh, the poor and the vulnerable out of poverty? And uh, are there arguments why the private sector uh, uh, and uh, civil society should uh, contribute, uh, particularly when uh, the state doesn't have the resources uh, amid all the economic problems and uh, and COVID? Uh, so the bottom uh, bullet point here on this slide uh, summarizes that we, we in this analysis we tried to do several things. One, estimate the, the mass of wealth held by a very small group of uh, people, uh, compare it or juxtapose it with the uh, the prevalence and the the depth of poverty experienced by a large share of the population, and then explore the fiscal instruments how to. Uh, uh, how to solve the problem of poverty without uh, killing the, uh, the goose and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, finding reasons how uh, this kind of uh, solution would be sustainable and, uh, and agreeable to all sectors of uh, the society. 
Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one uh, uh, fact that we were starting with were that was that um, small number of individuals, we found uh, 37 or 40 uh, uh, individuals uh, who were billionaires in the region. And uh, the, the sum of their uh, wealth uh, amounted to something like 110, 120 billion uh, dollars which turns out to be the national uh, gross domestic product of uh, uh, some uh, least developed countries in the region. In, in this graph uh, for year 2017, we saw that uh, the GDP for Sudan is uh, of the same magnitude as uh, the, the wealth of 40 individuals across the entire uh, region. Next slide, please. Now, the challenge that we faced was that uh, uh, data are not available uh, very much. They are not uh, comparable very well across uh, uh, countries. Um, there are, uh, uh, Khalid mentioned, some kind of speculative uh, uh, results that uh, uh, are available. And so we focused on using reliable data from multiple sources. Uh, we uh, we used the wealth information from, uh, from Forbes and from Credit Suisse uh, uh, to get uh, several competing estimates and to see whether they are uh, aligned with each other. Uh, for incomes and poverty levels, we used the World Bank's uh, POFCALnet and uh, some uh, uh, estimates and projections from UNDP. And we uh, uh, took a lot of care uh, making sure that we work with the same currencies, uh, uh, de deflate them to the same uh, base year. And uh, so we believe that the, the, the results that we produced and that I will present in a few slides uh, uh, make sense. And we're not comparing apples and oranges, uh, uh, that these numbers uh, uh, are realistic. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Just a quick comment here that the income growth projections were from UN DESA, not from UNDP, but that's just a, a minor uh, addition. Over to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started tabulating uh, information on wealth and uh, uh, and incomes in the in the region. Um, first, we started with uh, the Forbes uh, billionaires list, and we found that uh, this particular list had problems. It was, uh, um, as uh, you are probably aware, the uh, estimates of billionaires' wealth are not uh, uh, very accurate. Uh, these lists miss some, some population, the, the lists are not updated uh, regularly. And uh, so for, from Forbes, uh, we just got some kind of ballpark figures uh, to check, you know, how, uh, how, uh, how significant is this concentration of a handful of individuals of wealth uh, and what share of uh, the poor population in the region, we could be comparing these individuals to. So uh, as of 2019, we found 20, uh, 37 individuals on the, on the Forbes list, uh, their joint wealth, I don't see the bottom of the slide, but it should be 107 billion or so. It's 110 billion. Um, 110, okay, I don't see the bottom. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, now, the, the next challenge was, uh, well, we don't know anything about the wealth of the rest of the population. And uh, so we, we will have to do some kind of imputation based on uh, nation, uh, national reliable statistics. So in the next uh, three columns, uh, we show some uh, statistics from Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse uh, produces uh, an annual report of uh, the stock of wealth uh, in each country worldwide. I think the, the estimates are of uh, high quality, even if we, we might still think that they are uh, rather conservative. And uh, uh, so for each country, Credit Suisse reports the real wealth uh, per adult in each country, the number of adults in a country, the Gini coefficient, and these are based on these very simple uh, statistics on wealth uh, in uh, each country. We we took the uh, the liberty to uh, uh, 
uh, to estimate a, a full distribution of uh, wealth from the poorest people to the richest people in uh, in each country. Okay, uh, th there is uh, there is a recent literature saying that uh, this is not such a wild exercise uh, that uh, the the distribution of incomes and wealth uh, 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 has uh, a lot of regularities and. Uh, so we used the, the, the very regular and uh, um, standard and conservative estimates of what uh, the full distribution of wealth in each country should look like. And uh, based on that, we were able to estimate the, the mass of wealth, uh, not just among the billionaires, but also among the top 1% top of individuals, top 10% of individu individuals, as well as bottom 46% of individuals. And uh, this turns out to be interesting because we, we found, after this exercise, we found that uh, the wealth of the 37 billionaires in the region amounted to the, uh, the total wealth of bottom half of the region's uh, uh, population. Now I'm not sure if I said it. Uh, that's exactly that's correct. correct. So if you can't okay. see the low, the the the, the bottom uh, uh, row, it's basically the billionaire real wealth was around 108 billion, and the bottom 46 uh, percent of adults uh, had, or bottom half had, around 110 uh, uh, billion. So um, they are of almost equivalent uh, order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the right hand side of this table, we just show some uh, summary statistics or some results that we got for for each country. So uh, uh, on this slide, we show a regional analysis uh, where we, you know, looking jointly at the 37 regional billionaires, we find that uh, their wealth is equivalent to the uh, wealth of the bottom 46% of re uh, regional population. And we do a little bit of kind of comparison how, uh, who are the people at the top, who are the people at the bottom, and we don't find the same people at the top and uh, at, the, at the bottom. Uh, the, the billionaires uh, come from some countries, while the, uh, the bottom 46% of the uh, regional population come from uh, generally completely different, uh, different countries. For example, we find that 97% uh, of uh, uh, adults in Sudan are classified among the bottom 46% of the regional population. So, so 97% of uh, uh, Sudanese people are, are poor and uh, we don't have any billionaires uh, in the region coming from, from Sudan. Okay, uh, and then we uh, played with other uh, uh, economic groups. So we, we uh, started thinking, well, if we want to um, compare wealth of some rich individuals and, uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, compare it to the wealth of the poorest individuals, why don't we also look at the top, uh, top decile group? So on the right hand side of the table, we see some the, the uh, national composition of the richest 10% of uh, uh, the regional population. And, we, uh, and here we can see that uh, um, uh, I think tw 23, uh, uh, maybe- 23 see, billion, 24 billion, yes. Is, yeah, is, I see 64% of, 64% of Qatar's population in the region's top decile, while again, looking at Sudan, no, uh, it, uh, our estimates show that uh, no adult in Sudan is in the region's top 10%. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, uh, one second, please. Uh, with Getting close to um, to six o'clock your time, um, the London time. I so. think I think we will try to wrap up in seven minutes. Is that okay with you, Rondo? Uh, five. Or, five. Okay, five. Vlad, five you're gonna have okay. to, you're gonna have to run. You're gonna have to run, my friend. Okay. Uh, Sorry. 
Okay, I've already presented these stylized fa facts. Uh, move on. Uh, this is just illustrating the the technical work we did uh, by you know estimating a continuous smooth wealth distribution in across the whole region. And on this slide, I uh, just uh, show uh, the three major parts of the region: uh, the wealth distribution across all GCC uh, countries. Uh, again, the wealth distribution uh, uh, across all middle income. Arab countries and the the wealth distribution among the uh, all the uh, least developed uh, least developed countries and conflict uh, countries and what is interesting here is that uh, the three shapes are completely different from each other uh, uh, you know looking at the bottom 46% of the region's population we see that uh, that's really something like 80% uh, or the, the vast majority of uh, uh, those individuals come from uh, the least developed countries and conflict countries, while there are not that many people from GCC and middle income countries. And above the 46% line, uh, uh, again, there, there are very few LDC uh, citizens, but a uh, high number of um, GCC and uh, middle income country citizens. Uh, this uh, slide shows the Lawrence curve for the entire region. And again, and uh, there are three uh, color, uh, three colors here. Blue stands for GCC citizens. Uh, green stands for middle, uh, middle income country citizens. And the red uh, dots are for least developed country and conflict country citizens. And we can see that uh, these uh, three groups of countries don't uh, overlap at all. Um, so the if we if we have distributions across countries, they are not overlapping. But uh, GCC countries are up here, and uh, LDC countries are uh, in their entirety below the distribution for GCC. Next slide, please. I think this is the maybe the central uh, figure from our work. Uh, getting to the uh, the idea of uh, the cost of poverty reduction and what kind of tax would be needed uh, uh, or redistribution would be uh, would be needed um, uh, from the wealthiest people to supplement the incomes of the the income poor okay and uh, so just just very quickly, uh, uh, here, uh, this table is different from what I showed before, uh, because here the analysis is done at the national level. We, do, we carefully look how much wealth concentration we have in each country, so how much wealth in that one country could be redistributed to fund a poverty reduction within the same uh, country. Uh, the top half shows uh, uh, middle income countries, at the bottom half shows uh, the least developed and conflict countries. And we see that, so across all mix, uh, the top decile wealth in 2019 was $1.4 trillion. Doing a little bit of uh, projection to 2020, in, uh, in the middle of the COVID crisis, we, uh, our um, conservative and basic estimate is that uh, there is 1.3 trillion uh, dollars worth of uh, wealth in the top decile group. And uh, how does that compare to the poverty gap? What's a poverty gap? That's uh, the amount of money needed to lift people who are under national poverty line to, to uh, the poverty line uh, to get them essentially out of, uh, out of poverty. And we, found, uh, we find that those numbers are uh, in fact very low in the middle, uh, middle income countries. Uh, in 2019, this was $12.95 uh, uh, billion. Dollars. And 2020, uh, again, a, con a conservative estimate of the uh, poverty gap, uh, we have 15.6 billion dollars uh, so and at the at the right side of the table simple counterfactual uh, question well if we if we took the wealth of the uh, the richest 10 percent of uh, people and if we imposed a very simple uh, assessment such as one uh, percent 
would it be would it be enough to eradicate poverty or close the poverty gap in those countries and that's uh, that's what we find that as of 2019 uh, across these uh, middle income countries uh, the, uh, the the tax that would close the poverty gap it was 0.9% on average across the countries in the middle of the COVID crisis in 2020, we found that the, the necessary tax rate would be 1.2%, which is, uh, we, we find it, uh, that's a very, um, uh, very reasonable and a sustainable level of taxation. And uh, b based on these numbers, we, uh, we argued that uh, a solidarity redis redistribution from the wealth uh, rich toward the income poor is, uh, uh, is sustainable uh, 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 and, uh, and we uh, uh, listed out reasons why the entire civil society and private sector should agree with this form of uh, transfer. Uh, uh, the last sentence I will say here uh, is that uh, this redistribution would not be successful in the least developed countries where I don't, I don't see the numbers at the bo bottom of the slide, but... Uh, it, it will, let me, let me uh, explain it then very quickly. Basically, we'll take 35% wealth tax or, or 35 to 40 percent wealth tax annually in order to close the uh, uh, the poverty gap. Uh, so uh, basically, what Vlad is basically trying to say is that the cost of closing the, the poverty gap, regardless of of the scenarios, is within reach. It's 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 basically achievable. Just requires a, a political will, uh, and of course. Uh, uh, you know, that's something that goes back to our first proposition that does the society as a whole have the political will in order to do something about reducing inequalities? It's not just a technical issue. Uh, it's very much a political issue. But the bigger question is, and, and uh, if, Rhonda, if you just give me three minutes, I'll, I'll close. The bigger question is, can the Arab countries afford uh, not to take these bold steps? Can they afford to continue on with the same development model that they've had over the past uh, three or four decades? Well, not from an economic standpoint, not with the debts rising at the rate that they've been rising over the past decade. So um, almost all of the non-oil rich middle income countries are now at, at reaching a very precarious uh, debt to GDP ratio. And clearly something has to give. That situation cannot go on forever. And especially not with, um, the uh, rents, the oil rents per capita projected to decline in oil rich and oil poor countries. So these are the rents per capita. This is something that uh, I did for the ERF blog post. It's just a basic simple calculation of the re resource rents that come out of oil exports and, and uh, natural gas exports and the like per person. And as you can see, because of so many factors, including not the least the demographics, the, the, the rising population of the GCC and other oil-rich countries, uh, uh, you, you have a declining uh, a resource base per capita. That basically means that you don't have the fiscal space uh, that will allow you to continue on with your previous policies. Something has to change. And so the, con the conclusion that we have is that tapping into wealth is no longer uh, fanciful option, uh, it's really very much uh, has to be on the table. And I also uh, see that even the IMF lately has been discussing these options and many other circles and traditional orthodox, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic policy advocates have been more open to, to this. Uh, my conclusion is, is that it's not just economic policy that will uh, need to change. If the Arab countries are going to do something they need to change the role of the state. They need to think and reimagine of different public services. And what Rhonda's introduction has been arguing, and what I think many of the slides that we have shown have argued, that you, you have witnessed a significant change in the way uh, public service delivery has 
uh, been uh, taking place in a way that you've been emphasizing quantitative rather than qualitative gains. And take the example of uh, the efficiency of government. If you just take the World Bank government efficiency indicator and you correlate that with the simple indicator. One minute. Of, <laughs> one minute, that's it. One minute, the share of public sector employees. It would seem to me that Arab countries need to improve both on the efficiency and maybe even think of uh, working to, to improve the capacities of public sector employees. You can't have better health education systems without working on both the capacity and the efficiency of public service delivery. That's my last uh, slide. And thank you very much. Thank and apologies if we took uh, more time than a lot. Of. But you're the one who told us we can speak as much as we want. So <laughs> you're, 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 you bear some of the blame. Over to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -mm. Stop sharing. Okay, it's not. Um, oh dear. Hello, Masood. Is, um, uh, uh, just a, uh, Masood, are you? Okay. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, yeah, just one one second. Uh, I, I just want to apologize because I didn't introduce you properly, and um, I probably. I wanted to ask Sarah uh, about the timing that we have. So uh, just to say that uh, um, uh, Professor Mas uh, Masood was, uh, is now an emeritus professor. He's joining us from Boston, and he's a founding me member of the Iranian uh, uh, Association, uh, Economics Association and also um, at, at the uh, research, Economic Research Forum for Iran, uh, for the Arab region and Iran and Turkey, and uh, also um, both Vladimir and uh, Khaled um, are leading researchers at ESQA, especially with the, this current uh, reports on health and inequalities. Uh, Khaled has long been working also even with Masood about poverty um, uh, and about um, research about uh, multidimensional poverty. So participating in flagship reports. Similarly with uh, Vladimir, uh, he's been working uh, on Asia, but has joined ESQA to uh, spearhead this work on inequality in particular. And before that, he's also published worked uh, in, in Seoul at universities in Seoul and published in the World Bank Economic Review, um, et cetera, um, the review of income inequality. And I'm, um, and I'm teaching at SOAS. So um, we have, it's 10 past now. So uh, Sarah, do we have, how much time can we have? I think we have to give Masood at least 10 minutes. Well, I think I, yeah, okay. And then we can start the discussion 10, 15 minutes. Is that all right, Masood? Well, my, well, let's see, I can cut some of my- Yeah, fine, but let's go, uh, let's go. Thank okay, you. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss uh, this presentation by Khaled and Vladimir. Uh, can I share the screen, yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is my screen shared? Uh, yeah, but you can maximize. Yeah. Thank oh, I see. OK, OK. Uh, is it OK? Can you see it, Randa? Yes, yes, we okay. can. Okay, okay, thanks. OK, well, I'll. Uh, yeah, that's better. Yeah. I try to move quickly, and also I cut some of the technical bits. Maybe we can uh, discuss later with Khaled and Vladimir directly. You know, I broadly agree with most of their analysis and prognosis, but as a discussion, I'll try to look a bit in more detail into some of their findings and see if we can uh, throw up some uh, additions to uh, you know future research agenda that uh, Khaled uh, mentioned. Uh, well, in the literature, there seems to be some debate on the nature and trends of income distribution and poverty. And this is shown in the diametrically opposing narratives in Khaled's presentation. 
I think we do not have two stories. I mean, if you look at the, the two sides uh, that Khaled mentioned, we do not have two stories, but one story looked at from different angles. That is from individual country perspective and a regional perspective. The story one showed here and discussed by Khaled um, shows individual country income distribution and regional trends viewed from an individual country perspective. Story two told with the help of Piketty's diagram looks at income distribution from a regional perspective as if the whole region is one country. It's not just the addition of the top 1%. The story told by Piketty's picture is really the overall regional picture and is not the same story as the previous slide. Middle East happens to be a region where some of the richest countries with small population exist side by side with some of the poorest countries in the world with high population levels. The regional picture is of course of interest in relation to the political economy of region as a whole uh, etc. But uh, uh, but uh, really uh, doesn't help us if we want to understand what is happening in poverty and income inequality within the countries. Another anomaly that uh, mentioned by uh, uh, in the two stories of Khaled, this this discrepancy between national accounts and survey-based uh, average levels is is uh, also visible in per capita consumption levels. Uh, and it is not just a phenomenon related to the Middle East it's, uh, or Arab countries. It is a phenomenon which is uh, uh, really common to all countries which have survey and national accounts based data. And there has been literature how to sort this out. But you know, the, the work uh, of Khaled and uh, uh, Vladimir goes on st still to make projections of poverty based on national accounts growth rates, which is really problematic. In an earlier work, I had suggested calibrating survey means before making such projections. Uh, Ravalion has suggested using national poverty lines for such calibration, but anyway, this. Now, having said this, we can move to two important contributions of the work, which is the estimate of uh, the uh, resources needed to lift everybody out of poverty and also the measurements of distribution of wealth. So briefly, uh, and then the suggestions of the, uh, uh, the, the tax, wealth tax. Well, the estimation of poverty gap is of course uh, uh, an important contribution and is a lot of work involved in that. Uh, and uh, they give the cost of closing the gap for the countries in the region, but also they are Masoud, also- I think you're frozen. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, Masoud, you're fine. I think I'm he's fine. having some connection okay. issue. Okay. <clears throat> so they are correct in using national poverty lines rather than World Bank international poverty lines. The difference in the average consumption of the poor and poverty line is the amount needed to raise the average poor above the poverty line. If you multiply this by the number of the poor, it gives us the estimate of the cost of raising the consumption of all of the poor above the poverty line. And this is the measure they have provided uh, for 2019 and uh, 2020. In passing, it would be worth noting that if we multiply this difference by the total population is gives us the cost of the universal basic income. The difference between these two is that the first one is the cost of a targeted poverty eradication program. And the second one is universal. Universal basic income has become popular, particularly in the context of the COVID crisis. And therefore it may be interesting to provide estimates of that too. For countries such as Yemen and Sudan, where the majority of the population live below the poverty line, the difference between the two may not be very large. Uh, okay, so the paper provides, I mean, the report provides uh, the cost of uh, poverty education for all the 14 countries. Uh, and also 
compares it with the wealth of the top D side. Now, moving on to the wealth distribution work, they provide wealth distribution for 14 countries, but also across the whole region, which is really, this is a massive work and uh, very timely. Uh, they use estimates of average wealth and Gini coefficient of wealth distribution from the Credit Suisse data bank to estimate distribution of wealth in each country. This data is also supplemented by the data from Forbes 700 billionaires list. Reading the report uh, on this work, I was not clear how the same Gini coefficient is applied to upper and lower ends of the distribution, the log normal and Pareto distributions to estimate the distribution function. And also if the billionaire's data is used in fitting the upper tail. These issues need better discussion in the paper and warrants a separate, separate technical paper explaining their procedures in more detail. Another issue related to the, is related to the reliability of the Credit Suisse data on both the level and distribution of wealth in the countries in the region. The wealth levels are estimated by shortcut methods for all the ESCO countries in the Credit Suisse data bank. And they are considered as poor or very poor approximations by the Credit Suisse. Distribution of wealth is then estimated based on distribution of income and using extrapolations from distribution of wealth and income from countries where such data are available. This may be permissible in a large data set where consistency of data work is important, but where it comes to individual country studies where the absolute value of wealth is of interest, it may need more investigation. Another area of possible future work for uh, ESCO. I'm sure the authors of this study are familiar with many of these criticisms, and I think they are correct in believing that their estimates of concentration of wealth in the top side is likely to be very conservative but these estimates can be improved. Uh, of course, you know, it doesn't mean that the MENA region has higher concentration than other parts of the world like Latin America or United States, etc. Okay, the question of wealth tax. So they finally move to this very neat table about the wealth tax. Uh, they juxtapose the two estimates of the cost of poverty eradication and the wealth of top D side nicely presented in the following table for the two groups of countries. A wealth tax of around 1% on the assets of the middle income countries is sufficient to close the poverty gap. But for the least developed countries, this does not look feasible and foreign assistance is definitely required. Wealth tax in the context of COVID has been discussed in many countries, including the UK and various Latin American countries as a means of covering the cost of the cost imposed on governments by COVID and not necessarily as a poverty eradication program. So a few comments on uh, uh, on, on, on the results. You know, I think COVID would have much more profound effect on the regional economies and societies than can be captured by poverty gap projections. The real story of COVID is about inequality. It has a devastating effect on the informal workers and other blue collar working classes that have to be physically present at their workplace. It has hit remittance flows that is important for the low income families and tourism with devastating effects. I'm sure you know, Khaled and Ladmi are very well aware of this. So some of the immediate questions of interest are related to how are the effect, how are the affected workers catered for by the existing healthcare systems, as Randa uh, aptly mentioned, and the social safeness. What measures have governments taken, both preventive measures and compensatory measures, to deal with the situation? ESCOA website has plenty of interesting analysis of the likely impact of COVID on different population groups, but very little on what has been done in different countries. This I think is essential information and requires and a requirement before governments can aim for wealth taxes. The issues of legitimacy 
are addressed in the paper by Khaled and Vladimir, and they are related to these type of questions. Getting back to the tension between regional and national perspectives, a small wealth tax in top income countries in the region, the oil exporting countries, would be able to finance poverty eradication programs or even universal basic income programs in the poorer countries. But it would be difficult to tax private citizens in one country to subsidize another country. Of course, if the money can come from the existing government budgets without the need to raise taxes, this can be feasible. If you look at the sovereign wealth fund in oil rich economies in the region, you see that they have close to 3 trillion worth of assets. Any wealth fund manager worthy of the name should be able to get a return of five to 10% a year on these funds. And with recent stock market trends in countries where these funds are mainly invested indicates much higher returns on are likely. That brings at least between 150 to 300 billion dollars income a year uh, from the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, then a 10 to 20% tax on this income, not the wealth, not the assets, but the income of sovereign wealth funds would be sufficient to finance poverty education programs in low income and middle income countries in the region. This however should be managed by an independent body, not subject to political manipulation by the donors. A couple of final notes, just really we should focus more on the COVID, its short-term and long-term effects, and its particular impact on inequalities uh, within countries, across the countries, the impact on the budgets, as Khaled mentioned, is going to be uh, uh, important impact on this, the distribution of conflicts that it may create. We need to know how the governments are coping with COVID. How well do the healthcare and social protection systems cope with the pandemic and what caps there are? Then we have to also look at the long-term implication, inequality implications of COVID, particularly its impact in terms of educational attainments and opportunities. It has additional implications for education budgets. We have to be forward looking and foresee these developments if we are really concerned about inequality trends. And finally, I, I mentioned this to Khaled before the meeting, you know, uh, with the COVID, the kind of data sets and surveys that we have had been relying on so far up to 2019, it will no longer be available. They are not available for 2020, not likely to be available for 2021, uh, and maybe future years. And at best, we would have telephone call based surveys. So what would be implications for the research in ESCO. How can ESCO deal with this problem and what new initiatives are necessary? One suggestion is, for example, use of administrative data, encouraging governments to make, use, to make this data available. Administrative data is very valuable, but not used in, in, in the region. And therefore, I mean, these are the type of things one can do, but it's important to really address the question of uh, data as we go along, because we cannot just keep on uh, projecting into the future by using the past trends. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Masoud. And hello, everybody. My name is Sara Stevano. I'm a lecturer at SOAS, and I'm quickly stepping in for Randa, who's got uh, problems with her internet connection. So we have only a few minutes left. So uh, instead of going to Khaled and uh, Vladimir first, uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, share with uh, all of the speakers the three questions from the audience, and then we can do a round of responses, starting with Khaled, uh, Vladimir, and then Masood again. And then if Randa is back with us, and so she uh, can answer some of the questions. That yeah, I'm have. back. <laughs> okay, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to put the questions. No, yeah, 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 it's sure fine. With time. Yeah, so there sorry. is a question from uh, Sana. Um, who is saying Lebanon, as you mentioned, as half of its population living under the poverty gap got hit sever severely by the pandemic, corrupt government explosion and so forth. There has been foreign intervention and IMF, yet there aren't any significant changes. So what is the way to go from here? 
uh, and what are some of the baby steps they can take to move forward at least. Uh, um, then there is another forward-looking question from Batul, who's saying foreign aid interventions uh, and local aid has been more widespread during the pandemic, but would the shift in focus from poverty reduction uh, to simply alleviating the threats of COVID-19 be one of the main drivers uh, that results in an increase uh, uh, in the poverty gap? Uh, what should be done differently to ensure that these interventions uh, actually target poverty reduction? And then one final question from Omar, uh, who's saying, uh, regarding the wealth tax, uh, Aljoid may close the poverty gap. Um, is it not uh, merely a redistribution of wealth, uh, which does not tackle the lack of opportunities uh, that you mentioned earlier? Um, so uh, if uh, we can go around uh, with uh, some uh, reflections, uh, both on Masoud's uh, points, and then on some of these questions uh, as you see fit, so that would be great uh, in the very last few minutes. Uh, thank you. Khalid? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, I mean, this is obviously um, uh, very difficult to, to respond to all of these questions uh, in a matter of minutes, but, um, but I would like to thank Masoud, obviously, for his very... Um, um, uh, very pertinent and very and 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 and, and really very deep uh, analysis of uh, uh, some of the intricate issues, and I, I fully agree with him that um, there are you know there are many data problems, and and of course uh, we we do rely on um, uh, on on many assumptions. Many uh, of these forecasts are should should be taken to be rough estimates of order of magnitude possible. Uh, order of magnitudes of uh, of the impacts rather than precise estimates. Uh, so that's my um, and we we really do try in the paper to to highlight that all of the uh, uh, assumptions that were involved and all of the problems with the data that we rely on. But uh, let me go back to some of his more uh, interesting issues. First of all, the sovereign wealth funds uh, idea is very interesting, but of course that is only applicable for the GCC countries because many middle income countries, which is the ones where you get hard hit and the LDCs, they don't really have that uh, ability. Um, but for these GCC countries, the idea and the notion of a universal basic income is very much, uh, I think, the way to go. Uh, um, and, um, and again, that's a governance issue. It's not just a technical political issue. Um, how are governments coping with COVID? Uh, we did actually a lot of work on that. I mean, that's another subject that we can you know, speak on for another lecture. But if you go to the ESQA website, there is now a whole project that we have on monitoring social expenditures, which uh, tries to get much more in detail on how governments are spending, especially on the, on the social side, by function, by locality, et cetera. And we're trying to better gather the infrastructure, data infrastructure to answer that question. But there's also been an assessment of all the stimulus packages that we've had in the region so far, whether they've been in employment benefits, whether they've been in income transfers, whether they've been health support, uh, and especially to the vulnerable groups. Clearly, a lot has been done, but it's, uh, I mean, in Egypt, for example, there's been, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost like a hundred billion pounds, which I don't know is equivalent to maybe four billion dollars uh -huh. uh, just in one country in one year. Uh, and uh, we did an, uh, an, an analysis just to see whether the impact of that stimulus package has made a difference and, and it clearly has on the poverty story. So there are many, many such stories, but that's a subject for, uh, uh, for perhaps a more extended, uh, ex extended discussion. Sarah, Lebanon, what can be done the way forward? It's, um, it's very complex. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm, Rhonda's here, <laughs> she can probably help me out on this. Uh, but if you don't have a government in place, you really don't have any options. So clearly the first thing is you need to have a government and then uh, it's going to be a very rough road. But uh, everybody knows the problems in Lebanon are not economic. Uh, they're not related to the human capital. Lebanon has a wealth of economic potential. Human capital resources are the best in the region, whether you measure them years of schooling or, or, or health or otherwise. It's really more of a governance issue, I think. And, uh, and it, it, Lebanon is the classic example of the need for governance reforms. And everybody recognizes that, but 
it's a political stalemate. So I, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that question, even though I've been living in this country for 15 years. So. Uh, one final shot, redistribution will not tackle the structural issues. I fully agree. Uh, uh, this short is short-term analysis. And that also goes back to Masoud's question. Uh, the, we, I mean, this is not a, a long-term solution. This is basically what you can do in the short to medium term. But that's why my last slide, I tried to go to the whole issue about reimagining the role of the state and reimagining the function of the state in public service delivery, in health delivery and, and education delivery. If you do that, and you rethink, as Masood and I have been arguing, the, the nature of macroeconomic policies so that you can address Masood, the opportunities that go to these vulnerable groups and you can better tilt the scale towards them, then you have a shot at getting this Arab inequality paradox uh, uh, to be resolved at heart. But uh, that's obviously, you know, uh, it, it's going to be hard when you have rentier systems, when you have a political economy that's been uh, based on a very different social contract than the one that you desire. Is there hope? I think with the declining rents per capita and with the current situation being in, in so many different aspects, very challenging, uh, I think that there is hope because there is no other option. But the other option, as we've seen, is, is conflict. And I don't think anybody wants that. Let me stop here and hand it back over to you. Thank you very much, Khaled. Um, so I will need to ask everybody else if you want to add some thoughts to so be incredibly brief. I'm sorry, but we are already over the allocated time. So uh, Vladimir, do you have anything to add? Then Randa and Masood. No, I think Khaled already uh, gave a good version of uh, summarize all the important points that I would think of. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Randa, would you like to add? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, it's very difficult in a short time, but just an anecdotal evidence in Lebanon, uh, apart from having seven billionaires, it has more GC, um, uh, scanners, uh, medical scanners uh, per capita than Saudi Arabia, Turkey, or Qatar. So obviously, you know, when you leave your health system without leadership, you know, to the private sector in a conflict situation, uh, with lack of this redistribution, lack of rights, that's what you get. You get a, a, a catastrophe, national catastrophe uh, in a middle-income country. Plus, you have a, it's a product of the political failure. This is the title of a paper assessing the impact of the explosion and COVID. So, you know, the, the pandemic has highlighted the intersectoral intersectoral nature of the challenges. And it's not the poverty or COVID, they go together. If, you know, if you want to stop the transmission of COVID, if you want to give poor people jobs, they work together. So it's not either or, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging on all levels. And there is work being done, but unfortunately we're also caught uh, in the fault lines of the past and the systems that produce those inequalities and they don't disappear easily. And uh, I think that the work of ESCO is just signaling the need for a distribution, really. Uh, the fact that we don't have systems for distribution is a shame, really, because we now people are dying because of it. And I think as the uh, it will come to home people, uh, I think. It's a very personal long term, uh, but I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much. And sorry about the interruption. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, Randa. Don't worry. Masood, mm -hmm. a 30 seconds thought. Okay, to, well, to just, the uh, yeah, I think, you know, this wealth tax is very important that is raised by uh, ESQUA because it also encourages the researchers within countries and the governments to start paying attention and doing the estimates and going forward. And also, the reform of the taxes is important. On the uh, sovereign wealth funds, I didn't mean a fund for the oil rich countries themselves, but a fund provided by oil rich countries for the region as a whole. I think this is very important. I mean, this is important in the sense that, you know, we have a region which part of it is a wash in capital, another part is a wash in very skilled labor, etc. very complementary. And uh, 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 therefore, I mean, talking about this uh, sovereign wealth fund, which is not really eating into their capital, but it's using some of the income 
at this particular juncture. And uh, hopefully it opens the, uh, you know, the room for cooperation. And finally, I wanted to say about you know, redistribution. Okay, redistribution is good in itself, but really it doesn't provide the resources for a lot of these countries which are balance of payment constraints. They need external assistance. They need to import a lot of their, you know, even the vaccines, et cetera, but also in terms of, uh, you know, going forward, if you redistribute and your consumption levels go up, you need, you need uh, mm -hmm. imports. So that's, uh, that's another thing to keep in mind, yeah. which uh, relates to restructuring of the economies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Masood, and thanks again to uh, Randa also for having organized this webinar and to uh, Khalid and uh, Vladimir. Uh, we are very grateful to have uh, Haji with us today. And to, before you all go, I just would like to mention that our next uh, webinar in the SOAS Economics uh, webinar series uh, is coming up in a couple of weeks on the, 23rd, on the 24th of February, and it will be on rebuilding macroeconomics uh, from the margins. Uh, so we will be discussing two projects uh, uh, led by uh, Elisa van Bayenberg one and Daniela Gabor, uh, the other one. So do join us in a couple of weeks time, uh, but thank you all again to particularly to our speakers uh, and also to our audience uh, and to have a good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure thank to be so here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.